This is Psych Boost, helping you with your psychology qualification one video at a time. This video is on language, and in the 16th GCSE video, we'll be covering nonverbal communication. The very kind support of students and teachers who donate on Patreon help me help you by continuing to make these videos and resources. A very big thank you for your help, guys, to join them follow the link. And for everyone, you might want to check out the free worksheet for this video and the quiz. So as usual, just next to me, here are the terms from the AQA GCSE specification that we're going to cover in this video. As we go through the video, they'll be in red text. So you're going to need to be able to respond to questions on all of this. Let's start by defining exactly what we mean by verbal and nonverbal communication. Verbal communication is the use of words to pass on information. Now, of course, we mean when words are spoken, but we also classify written words as verbal communication. And nonverbal communication is basically everything else. Now, obvious examples are facial expressions and body language, but less obvious is nonverbal communication within verbal communication, so the tone and volume of what you say. Just think of all the different ways that you can say sorry, especially when you didn't mean it. Okay, let's go into detail about some common forms of nonverbal communication, starting with eye contact. This is when two people look directly at each other or avoid looking at each other to pass on social meaning. If you're having a meaningful conversation with someone, you're going to be using eye contact to regulate the flow of that conversation, indicating when the other person is going to respond. The person who's speaking will look away and the person listening will be looking. Okay, this is what you came for, signaling attraction. Two people flirting will often hold eye contact for an extended period while talking. This indicates an interest in the other person. Eye contact across a crowded room is also a signal in initial attraction. The level of eye contact in combination with other body language signals also indicates to the other person how much emotion they feel, with people appearing more angry, happy or sad if they hold the eye contact. Body language is how we use the position of our body parts to pass on information, usually about our emotional state. There's a clear distinction between open and closed postures. Open postures show self-confidence. It also indicates that we like the other person. It's relaxed and open with the arms facing towards the other person. A closed posture suggests low self-confidence, disapproving and rejecting the other person. It's tense, crossed arms, hunched and facing away. Postural echo, also known as mirroring, is when people copy each other's body language. This again is common in people who are flirting as it demonstrates interest in that other person. And touch. Touch is generally used to indicate affection for the other person, but it can be used to indicate dominance. Another aspect of body language is the distance we place our bodies from another person. We have an area around our bodies that we see as our own personal space, and we expect other people to avoid it. How close we're happy other people getting depends on our relationship with them. Strangers are furthest away, then people we know, and then close relationships the closest physically. If you get into someone's personal space, it can indicate familiarity or intimidation. As we learn personal space from socialization, we find there are significant cultural differences with what's acceptable personal distance around the world. Contact cultures such as South America, the Middle East and Southern Europe tend to have smaller personal space than non-contact cultures of Northern Europe, North America and Asia. Gender also plays a role in personal space, with men keeping a larger distance between each other than women keep with other women. Status plays a role. People of a similar social status will be closer together, compared to people of a combination of high and low status who will keep a larger distance between each other. Evaluating nonverbal communication, we can suggest that research in this area is important, especially to help people who struggle to socially communicate with others. Understanding variations in body language between cultures also helps with international business and politics. However, much of the research on body language is open to subjective interpretation. As body language is an unconscious process, it's unlikely that participants are able to accurately self-report on their own body language. How much of body language is instinctual, so from genetics and innate, or how much of body language is learned from socialisation, so nurture, is up for debate. There are strong arguments and evidence for body language being a result of genetic inheritance. Researchers point to the body language of newborn babies and sensory-deprived children. 
These are participants who have not been able to visually observe and imitate the body language of others. So any body language they display must be instinctual. So if we look at neonates, so newborn babies, we can see a pre-cry expression of sadness, as well as showing what we would recognise as smiling, surprise and disgust. As babies show these expressions before seeing them modelled, this suggests that the expressions are innate. We have the genes to smile from birth. The same expressive behaviour is found in studies of children born sensory deprived. If facial expressions were learnt through imitation, these children who can't see shouldn't be able to use the same facial expressions in the same way as other children. But well, problems in research in this area are potential researcher bias, with researchers interpreting babies' body language in a way that supports their theories, and counter-evidence of cross-cultural differences in body language, suggesting that body language is learnt, not inherited. And while it's likely that some aspects of body language are innate, a better explanation of body language is that we're born with some innate body language traits, but these adapt in response to experience, which is an interactionist approach. So the counter to body language being inherited is the idea that body language is learnt. Our body language develops due to observing other people's body language and observing people's responses to our body language and then adapting. Strengths of body language being learned are the fact that body language varies from person to person. Some people invade your personal space, some people use too much eye contact and touch, and also we all vary our body language significantly depending on the social context, all suggesting alert behaviour. There's also cross-cultural research that we're about to talk about showing people use body language differently around the world. But criticisms of body language being learned is the evidence from babies using body language in early life, and the possibility of an interactionist approach explaining body language better than learning alone. So, we do have a research study on body language to consider. The study is by a researcher called Yuki, who was interested in the differences between the emoji used by his Japanese and American friends. In preparation for this video, I found some examples of Japanese text emoji. They're amazing, there's literally thousands of them. They're so expressive. It just puts a smiley face to shame, go Google it. What Yuki found so interesting about these Japanese emoji was a focus on the eyes. Western emoji tend to have more of an emphasis on the mouth. So Yuki set up a study that investigated cultural differences in the interpretation of emotion in emojis. The method was presenting Japanese and Americans with a range of emoticons. These had been specially developed to have combinations of eyes and mouths that were either sad, neutral or happy. The participants had to rate each face on the scale of 1 to 9. Yuki found the Americans rated the emoticons with the happy mouths as the happiest, but the Japanese rated the emoticons with the happy eyes as the happiest. The same was found with sadness, the Americans rating the emoticons with the sad mouths as most unhappy, and the Japanese rating the ones with the happy eyes as the saddest. So from these results, Yuki concluded Japanese and Americans have different interpretations of the same facial expressions, with Americans focusing more on the mouths and Japanese the eyes for interpreting emotion. When evaluating Yuki, we can see that the research showing cross-cultural variations in perceiving body language matches other research showing cultural variations in perception. But to criticise Yuki's study, we could argue it lacks validity. The study didn't use real human faces that we're more used to interpreting than emoji. Human faces are more complex, and often when interpreting emotion in real life, we see faces moving. Also, the emotional range was limited. There may only be cultural variation in interpreting happy and sad faces. Maybe for other emotions, Japanese and Americans look at the same facial features. We also need to consider the possibility of demand characteristics. The participants were aware they were taking part in a lab study, and might have guessed the aims of the study and altered their behaviour. So to finish on body language, we'll consider why we've evolved to have body language at all. Of course, in any discussion of evolution, we should start with Darwin, the 19th century naturalist who argued that traits that help with survival are selected for and then passed on to the next generation. Now, often when thinking of evolution, we think of physical traits, but psychological traits are also evolved. If we observe animal behaviour, we see a range of non-verbal behaviour that's common across the species. Examples are courtship rituals in birds and dominance displays in primates. If you raise a social primate in isolation and then show it pictures of primates showing threatening body language, 
the primate will respond to the image. So we would conclude that animals have evolved an instinctive knowledge of body language. Evolved traits are adaptive, so nonverbal communication has to in some way help a creature survive. We can use a wide range of animal examples, but even just with humans, babies show a wide range of body language that is designed to trigger caretaking behaviour in adults, helping their survival. So if we need to evaluate the evolutionary perspective in nonverbal communication, we can support it with evidence of human body language from birth. But we can also question the universality of body language between humans. If body language isn't universal among humans, it's not evolved, but learnt. So now we've covered all that content, you need to actually be able to use that information to answer the questions. Here are five questions I've made up to test your skill. So pause the video and give them a go. For those of you who support me on Patreon, I've put together an additional video showing you how to answer these properly. For everybody else, thanks for watching, like, subscribe, and see you in the next video on neuropsychology, the structure and function of the nervous system.